Buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por estar aquí en, en la conferencia de John Scofield, aquí en el Museo Arqueológico Nacional. Eh, la sección de Arqueología del Colegio de Doctores y Licenciados quiere agradecer a todos los organizadores de, de este acto, que no es un acto cualquiera, con su complemento de mañana, mañana sábado, eh, en particular a Haas Arqueología y a su, a su mentor, que es Jaime Almansa, que como sabemos es un trabajador infatigable y es el que ha, el que ha organizado todo esto. Eh, también queremos dar las gracias a, al Centro Revolucionario de Arqueología Social, CRAS, que es fundamentalmente el organizador del acto de mañana en, en Tabacalera, que como tendremos ocasión de comprobar quienes estemos en los dos, será completamente distinto de esto que vamos a ver hoy. Finalmente, damos las gracias al anfitrión de, de este acto, que es el Museo Arqueológico Nacional, que con esta conferencia de Arqueología del pasado reciente amplía el, el elenco habitual de, de eh, charlas sobre arqueología. Es una cosa un poco inhabitual la que, la que vamos a ver hoy y de esa manera pues, se convierte un poco más en lo que, en lo que debe, todos pensamos que debería ser el Museo Arqueológico Nacional, que no es otro lugar que la casa de todos los arqueólogos y las arqueólogas que trabajamos en este país. En cuanto a la persona que nos acompaña hoy, que es John Scofield, es, eh, es arqueólogo, es jefe del Departamento de Arqueología de la Universidad de York desde el año 2012 y eh, trabajó en English Heritage desde finales de los años 80 del siglo XX. Esto le permitió involucrarse en la protección del patrimonio a todos los niveles y al margen de eso pues, desarrolló una carrera como arqueólogo con diversas líneas de investigación, una de las cuales es la que nos viene a contar hoy, que es la arqueología del pasado reciente que se centra en edificios recientes, edificios abandonados en época reciente y en cuestiones musicales como eh, la que mm, conforma su otra faceta, la faceta del de DJ Hipocampus, que tendremos ocasión de disfrutar mañana. Sin más, os dejo con, con John Scofield. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all very much for coming. I'm going to stand up, if that's all right. I prefer to stand up than to sit down. Um, I guess there's no football today, so maybe that's why there's such a good, a good turnout. Um, but Caroline and I are staying in Madrid for a few days, so we're looking forward to seeing Spain play on Sunday, is it, or Monday? Anyway, we're looking forward to that. Okay, so... Um, As was explained in the introduction, I am an archaeologist. Some people might see some of the examples I'm going to show you and think maybe I'm not an archaeologist or I'm not a real archaeologist. Uh, I think I am. I studied prehistoric archaeology, first of all, at Southampton University. Um, and those of you who are archaeologists were, may have heard of um, Professor Peter Ucko or Professor Clive Gamble. And these are the people who taught me. And they're very eminent archaeologists whose specialism is, is hunter-gatherers. So the, the, the distant past when people were still hunting and gathering before farming was introduced. So that was my background. And I did a PhD in that topic before I moved to English Heritage and before I started to become more interested in uh, the contemporary past or the recent past. So this evening I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey through my career Um, and I'm going to give you a number of examples of work that I've been involved with, which I hope will persuade you that the archaeology of the contemporary past is something that's useful and relevant in today's society. And I will touch in some of those examples on the relationship between place and the past and heritage and, and music, because I think music is a part of it as well. It's not just about buildings, it's about what... what went on in those buildings as well, and sometimes that's musical performance, for example. So my first slide, I could ask if anyone knows where that is, but obviously it's a very nice beach, um, and you may guess all sorts of things. Maybe some of you might guess the Galapagos Islands. If you've been Googling me, you will have probably realized that this is Galapagos. And this is one of my latest projects, and a very exciting project that I'm involved with, And it, it's almost as though I'm coming back to my, to my roots as a prehistoric archaeologist, because it is about looking for subtle 
traces of past human behavior um, and trying to make sense of it. Why is it there? How did it get there? What human behaviors led to these things being on this beach in Galapagos? And the things that I'm particularly interested in are in this person's hands over here, and it's plastic. And this is microplastic, the very tiny pieces where a bottle or a, um, a vessel has broken down into its smallest parts. Uh, but sometimes you find the big items, bottles and plastic cups and plastic straws as well. And that's universal. All over the world, these things are washing up on beaches and presenting a real serious environmental problem. So my work on Galapagos is trying to find a way of resolving that problem, or at least trying to understand it in order to then be able to try to resolve it. But I'll come back to Galapagos at the end. Very briefly, here are two site plans from some of the texts that I was studying when I was an undergraduate archaeologist in the early 1980s. Um, over on, the, on your right-hand side is a plan drawn by a famous archaeologist of a very famous archaeological site um, in France, a Paleolithic site. I can't remember how old this site is now exactly, but it's something like 30 or 35,000 years old. Um, and these were hunters and gatherers who were living on this site. And what you see here is just a plan which shows the artifacts and the, the human behaviors that are believed to have caused that artifact scatter on the ground. And that still survives today and was excavated by this famous archaeologist. And on the left-hand side is a similar plan drawn by a different archaeologist, but showing almost exactly the same behaviors and the same residue. Um, but, but this is a modern site. This is a hunter-gatherer site from today. It's the Nunamiut Eskimo site uh, up in the high Arctic. But they're almost identical in the way that the, 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 the human behaviors are clustered around a fire pit um, and, the, um, and the artifacts that are generated by the people who are sitting around the fire making tools, for example. So this was one of the things I was taught as an archeologist back in the early 1980s. And we were taught that if you study the modern period and you study modern hunter-gatherers, then that allows us to better understand hunter-gatherers in the distant past, which is true. It's, it's, it's a fair comment, and people still do this kind of work today. But the thing that's changed, and the thing that I was particularly interested in our, when I was a student, was the fact that this also tells us about modern society and how things, in this particular case, haven't ch really changed very much over 30 or 40,000 years. I was more interested in the modern than I was in the ancient. It took me a long time to realize that, but when I did realize it, it was like a light bulb going on, and I was thinking, ah, oh, yes, that's, that's what I'm interested in, so that's what I'm going to study. And I was working for English Heritage when that, when that light bulb came on. Uh, so just another example of this, and this does start to touch on my own work. Not the one on the left, this is just a picture taken off the internet, but it's a, a picture of a shell midden. So this is again, probably hunter-gatherers living on the coastline um, and living off seafood and, and shellfish. Um, and this vast midden is their rubbish pit, basically. And it's all the, shell, the shells uh, that are generated by consuming lots of shellfish. So the, the waste is just built up and built up and built up into these huge mounds of shells. So that's, th that's the prehistoric element. And on the right-hand side, this is a project I did in Berlin, looking at the detritus or the refuse left behind after um, uh, pop-up um, impromptu parties that are happening in the city every night of the week and certainly at weekends, these techno, techno parties. And I will come back to this later and I'll explain why that's really interesting in terms of heritage in Berlin today. But this is the kind of, this is the kind of archaeological trace that you find the morning after, the night before, if you like. And personally, I don't see any difference between this kind of archaeology and this kind of archaeology. Some people do, but I don't. It's like trying to put a, a time limit on when something becomes archaeology. And if you're going to do that, when do you, when, where do you draw that line? Is it 100 years ago? Is it 50 years ago? Or 10 years ago or 1,000 years ago. If you start to think in those terms and you say, well, yes, if it's 101 years ago, then we can study it as an archaeologist. But if it's 99 years ago, then we can't. 
It seems to me like a ridiculous argument. So I don't draw a line at all. I just find that much easier. And it means that an archaeologist can look at things like this and learn things about ourselves. Not about people in the past, but about ourselves. So this is the order of the talk today. It's going to run for about another 40 minutes or maybe 45 minutes, I think, something like that. And I'm just going to run through these particular topics, which are all different ways of thinking about what I call the contemporary past. So that's the contemporary past is the, is the past all around us. It's the things that happened just now, if you like. It's in the present when we do it, but of course, as soon as it's done, it's in the past. Um, and it's the past of living memory, essentially. So it's, it's what we remember and how we think about the things that we remember and how we might encounter those events that we remember through the material culture, the artifacts left behind. I'll give you plenty of examples if you're struggling with that concept. There'll be plenty of um, examples which may make it easier to understand. So first of all, this is a staple of archaeological um, uh, education and archaeological study. It's the thing that we all learn as archaeologists. One of the first things we learn, that archaeology is actually not about things at all. It's about people. But we can only understand those distant people from the things that they leave behind. The people aren't there anymore, so we can only really get to the people through the artifacts they've left behind. But it is ultimately all about people. I'm just going to put one or two slides up, which are like my rough notes, if you like. When I was preparing this lecture, I just made some notes about how it might be structured. And I, I thought, like when you, do, when you do maths at school now, not like when I was at school, but now when you're at school and you do maths, you're expected to show all your working out, working as out. So how did you get to the answer that you got to? And the teachers want to know not only what the answer is, but how you got to that answer. And that's kind of what I'm doing here. I'm just showing you some, giving you some notes, which is how I got to produce this talk, I suppose. Um, and the point of this one, really, is to say that I forgot that archaeology was about people. I kind of lost sight of that when I started working for English Heritage. It, it became all about the buildings and the monuments and not about the people anymore. Um, and then when that light bulb that I described earlier on went on, that was when I also remembered archaeology is actually all about people and we've forgotten about the people. So we need to come back to that. Um, and it's, everything I've done since then has been about, about people. And this is the person who first said it, a famous archaeologist um, around the world actually, but he's very well known in the UK because he is British, um, Sir Mortimer Wheeler. So some of you may have heard of him. He's he's, he features a lot in the history of archaeology and textbooks about the, the history of archaeology. But he said this. I won't read these uh, words out to you because I, I, maybe the translator is doing that for you. But it, it does make the point that archaeology is not about things. It's about people. And that was in 1954. So here's an example for you. This is a Cold War airbase in England um, where cruise missiles, so these are the missiles that would have been fired in, in, in retaliation against the Soviet Union had the Soviet Union attacked the West. And at Greenham Common is one of six sites across Europe where, where cruise missiles were stationed. And had the attack come, these missiles would have been fired. Um, and it's a very famous site, not so much because of the cruise missiles that were stationed there, but because of the protest movement and the peace camp that grew up at Greenham. Um, and peace women who occupied this site for about seven or eight years, and they lived there all the time. They gave up their families in some cases, they gave up their jobs, they gave up everything for this very, very strongly felt belief that they were doing something much bigger than that. They were, they essentially, they believed that they were saving the world in some, in some way. Um, and it was, it, was a, it was a really strong presence at Greenham Common, and a presence that left some really interesting archaeological records, um, not only on the inside of the fence where you have the big missile shelters, these vast concrete structures where the missiles were stored, but the other side of the fence was where the peace women were living in the woods under, under pieces of... Um, um, plastic and tarpaulin. But this is where I first encountered real people in my archaeological work. Not dead people, 
but living real people with real stories and real memories. Um, and here she is. I won't, I won't name her, but she's a, she's a woman who came to visit uh, our project. We were just surveying these women's peace camps, and then one day she turned up um, and told us all about life on the camp. Um, and it kind of brought the site to life. And imagine as an archaeologist, when you're an undergraduate and you're learning the subject for the first time, being told that one day you'll be digging a site and someone will turn up who had actually lived there and they'll tell you all about it and where things were in the, in the landscape. This is where we had the fire pit and this was where I had my tent and so on. And she said, have you ever visited, um, what was it called now? Was it Emerald, Emerald Gate? Yes, Emerald Gate. Have you ever visited Emerald Gate? Which was the name the women gave to a particular and very small campsite. Um, where the women went, they didn't live there all the time, they just went there occasionally to watch what the American airmen were doing inside the base. So they were kind of just there, hiding in the woods, living in their tents, and just watching and waiting. Which was very like that campsite I showed you earlier on in that second slide, that I showed you those two plans of campsites. They were watching sites. It's where hunter-gatherers used to sit and wait for the migration of animals through the landscape. So it's a very similar kind of place, in a, in a way. They were waiting and watching something very different, of course, but they were just watching and waiting. Um, and she took us to this site, Emerald Gate, which we'd never heard of, and she said, and this is where we used to come, and this is where I used to roll up all of our stuff when we left the site, and we used to hide it under these bushes, so it was there next time when we came back. And she rummaged around under the bush and pulled out her tarpaulin, the, 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 the plastic she used to sleep under, and also her coffee cup and her coffee pot and her kettle. And she pulled these things out of the bushes and said, here they are. And you can see by the look on her face how pleased she was to recover these objects that were from her, like her, her own history, her own story. And that was another light bulb, that this can happen on an archeological site, that people can encounter their, their own past, their own story um, through an archeological project. So another project, this isn't one of mine, but, but a number of people are at the moment, archaeologists at the moment are working on migration and working with migrant communities at various stages of the process, um, at various stages of the journey. Uh, sometimes at the start of the journey, uh, working with communities which is receiving a lot of, uh, where, where a lot of people are leaving um, to go to other places, other safer places in most cases. Um, also looking at the journeys themselves such as the Greek islands, for instance, and Malta, um, and across Africa into Europe, um, and also working with those communities when they arrive as well. Because everybody has some kind of attachment to the place where they, where they grew up, where they live, and where they are currently, whether they choose to be there or not. There is some kind of attachment that people have to that place. Not always positive, sometimes it's a negative feeling, but they will have some sort of feeling about the place where they find themselves. And that make, makes it quite easy to have a conversation with people based around heritage or archaeological kind of issues. So what does this place mean to you? What, uh, what is it about this place that you like? What, makes you, what is it that's, that's here that makes you feel safe? Is there anywhere here where you feel unsafe or vulnerable, where you feel uneasy? Um, and having those kind of conversations is one that archaeologists are increasingly having with migrants. And of course, again, archaeology has dealt with migration in the distant past um, for as long as archaeology has been around. One thinks, for example, of the out of Africa theory of human evolution, where people moved out of Africa into, into Europe several hundreds of thousands of years ago. That's a migration as well. And you wonder what those people went through when they were making those journeys. So it starts to relate to um, similar situations that people would have felt in the past, albeit for very different reasons. So what is the contemporary past? We ought to have a, some sort of a definition of, of, of this. Um, I think for me, one of the main things about it is that it, it's, it, it introduces something that's very relevant to people. A lot of people, most people, one might say, are interested in archaeology. So if there was a, an excavation in your, in your local town or your local village or something, 
um, you'd just be really interested to know what, what came out of the ground and what it told you about this place that you, you know so well about its history. So maybe it's a Roman excavation or a, a prehistoric excavation and you learn something about the people that used to live in your village or your town in the past. Um, with contemporary archaeology, we can do things that are of the here and now. So we and we can involve people in that process and we can actually have conversations with people about what they think should happen to that place in the future. So you can start to talk about planning and what, what this town should look like in 10 years' time or 20 years' time based on what was there in the past. So you can have all sorts of quite interesting conversations. And sometimes archaeology is a part of that conversation. But it's very much about the here and now. And it's about uh, encouraging people to participate and to think about archaeology as a the study of the human past as a continuous story, which comes right up to date. So we're a part of that story too. We just happen to be the people who are here now. But in the past, there were lots of other people who have left stuff behind. Uh, they're not here anymore, but we are. So we're part of a, of, of a very long human story. And that continuity, I think, is part of, the, part of the argument. So it is the archaeology of us, the places that we create, the places that we shape in our everyday lives, um, and the influence that we have on the places that we live in and where we work, the places we travel to, and so forth. So it is, about, it is very much about, about us. I like these phrases. These are, these are, I find, very useful phrases um, because we often think that the world around us is a very familiar world. We know about it. We live it. We read the newspapers. We read, read about it. We see it on television. It's a world we understand really, really well. But I don't think we understand it as well as we think we understand it. Um, and there are lots of parts of this contemporary world uh, that are very unfamiliar to us. And I'm going to give you an example a little later on, which is... Um, which I, I hope will resonate and is, is an example of, of, of that. And the second quote is very useful too, because as archaeologists and people who work in the heritage sector, um, as I did for a long time, we're used to dealing with making decisions about things that are from the past. So we're disconnected from it in time. With the contemporary past, we're not. We're part of it. And that gives us a very different relationship to the kinds of buildings that we're talking about. If it's a Neolithic monument like Stonehenge or something, it's 5,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago. So there's a very long, there's a very wide distance that's built up between us as the people that make decisions about that site and the archaeological site itself. But if it's a building that's only just been built, but it's a really stunning building and everybody says, oh, we've got to, we've got to protect this building somehow. It's such an exemplary building that we need to make some sort of a decision about it now, um, that's more difficult because it's, it's our building. It's too new. How do you make a decision about something that's so recent? And there have been cases recently where the building has been considered for protection before it's even finished. So you've almost got the past overtaking us, if you like. So the past, has, the past is in the future, <laughs> if you like, rather than in the past in a funny sort of way. So if we think about archaeology as something that's about the contemporary, um, I, I sort of put this, put this set of rough notes in because I was thinking, okay, so what does this mean to me? So I was born in 1962, and some of you will have heard of the term the Anthropocene, or the Anthropocene. So this is a, a, the new, a new geological era that's been defined, and it's the geological era where humans have had a detrimental impact on the environment in one way or another, through nuclear testing, through marine pollution, back to Galapagos again, through space junk up in, the, up in, up in space. All of these things have all started to happen um, in the, from the 1960s, well, certainly from the 1960s onwards, and certainly it's become a major problem from the 1960s onwards. Um, and that's, that's, that's how long I've been on this planet as, as well. So it's kind, of, it's kind of my archaeology, if you like, and um, those two things are of that coincidence is, is quite challenging for me sometimes. So this is this marks the beginning of the Anthropocene. This is from the journal Nature, which some of you will have heard about. 
Um, and this is um, uh, some findings recently on what's been termed the world's loneliest tree. Here it is, world's loneliest tree on um, Campbell Island in the South Pacific. It's a very, very remote island with a tree on it. <laughs> the only tree on the island. There are lots of bushes, but there's only one tree. And they've studied this tree, and they've, they've taken tree rings from this tree, and they've identified within it, in the tree rings, you can see um, where the environmental testing started to happen, the, the nuclear testing started to happen um, in October to December 1965. And you can actually see one of these tests in the tree rings. So that's been identified in this journal Nature as the start of the Anthropocene. It's an actual event which started the Anthropocene. And it's something that you can see in the environmental record. And the reason I show you that is because one of my, another one of my early adventures, if you like, into contemporary archaeology was here in the American Midwest um, at the Nevada test site in, the, in Nevada State. Um, this is a, a map of, I don't know if you can see it in enough detail, but there's a map of Nevada there. And uh, the gray, the gray area is the Nevada test site. It's a, it's a vast landscape um, which was used for the conduct, uh, for the conduct of um, various scientific tests, but most notably and notoriously the nuclear testing, both below ground and above ground nuclear testing. Um, that's a genuine postcard up at the top. Greetings from the Nevada test site with a mushroom cloud in the background. Um, and in fact, Las Vegas as a city is just down the road. It's about, it's about 80 kilometers away now, but Las Vegas is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it's getting closer and closer to the Nevada test site. Um, but back in the 1950s and the 1960s, um, it was about 120 kilometers away, something like that. Um, and a lot of the 1950s and early 1960s postcards of Las Vegas showing the big motels and hotels where the rich and famous used to go to stay and to gamble. They all have, well, a lot of them have a little mushroom cloud in the background, so you can sort of see it. It's been airbrushed in, um, but, but it's there. And it's kind of, Las Vegas kind of embraced the nuclear testing program. Marilyn Monroe um, once wore an ato um, a mushroom cloud uh, dress, famously. And there was a, you could get a mushroom cloud hairdo in the, in, the, in the hairdressers in Las Vegas. So they, at that time, it wasn't considered to be dangerous. Um, it very soon became obvious that it was, but in the very early days, it wasn't. This was something to be celebrated. It was the new dawn and new technology, brave new world. So let's embrace it. Well, this is the, the landscape of that testing program. Um, and this is a yucca flat, which is one named after the plant, the yucca, which used to grow there. Um, and this is just one small area of the Nevada test site. And this is the area where underground tests were conducted. And you, it looks a bit like the moon, I guess, from where you're sitting. Um, you can see all these little craters. And every single one of those craters is the, the archaeological trace, if you like, of uh, a separate, independent, um, underground nuclear test, which would have cost a vast amount of money, a huge number of scientists would have been involved, generating a m massive amount of data, which would probably have then informed the next underground test that was conducted. And what you end up with is this landscape of, well, it's a landscape of nuclear testing. It's a landscape of, of, of I don't know what you call it really, technological, I hesitate to use the word, but progress. Um, but it's a it's but in terms of human history, it's a really interesting place. It's a terrifying place, but a really interesting place. And the picture at the top left is what you see when you visit all of those craters on the ground. So not only is it a crater, which is all you see from the aerial photographs I showed you just now, but when you go down on the ground, all of the infrastructure all of the buildings associated with that test are still there. And all of the you can see all the cabling, which carried all the data away from the test. Um, the mobile laboratories, that silver truck thing there. It's all just been left because it was, it was brought in for that particular test. And then it became redundant because technology had moved on. 
um, and they needed a new set of laboratories for the next test. And being a very remote location, there was no need to clear it. So from an archaeological point of view, this is great. There's so much stuff here that you can, that you can study and examine um, and, and look at this progression, this, this, um, this the, the way in which nuclear testing evolved over time at this particular place. So the other side of the fence from the nuclear testing grounds is uh, that, that, and this. So this is also at the nuclear testing grounds, this building here. So this was from the nuclear tests. So it was designed to sort of see what would happen if you set off a, a nuclear uh, weapon and to see what, what impact it would have on normal domestic buildings. If any of you saw the last of the Indiana Jones films, did you see that film? And the, the opening scene of that film shows Indiana Jones lost in this nuclear testing site, which was the Nevada test site. And he finds himself in one of the buildings just as they're about to set off one of the tests. And all the mannequins in the th all, was all fully dressed and there's a radio playing and so forth. Well, that's kind of what it was like here. And they wanted to see what would happen to all of this domestic, all these domestic interiors in the event of a nuclear explosion. So th the other side of the fence from the nuclear test is, uh, are the other images, and that's the peace camp that grew up around the Nevada test site. Um, and this is a fascinating archeological landscape. And remember that my background was in prehistoric archeology. span And one of the things that you typically encounter as a prehistoric archeologist is things like the kind of monuments that are normally considered ritual monuments. Things like stone circles and stone rows and standing stones. You've, you know all of that stuff. It's probably, you've probably got examples of some of the finds from similar sites of a similar period in this, in this museum. Well, imagine my excitement when I started discovering or finding um, stone circles and stone rows and standing stones from the 1960s that the peace community living here in this desert location had built. So these are, again, ritual monuments in the way an archaeologist would understand that term. Um, and in stone circles, you find these ceramic face masks. And those face masks only occur in stone circles. You don't find them anywhere else on the site. Not every stone circle has a mask in it, but all the masks are found in stone circles. So here we have, effectively, a prehistoric ritual landscape that's actually from the 1960s and 70s and possibly even into the 1980s. And to bring this all really up to date, um, while we were conducting this work, um, the local, uh, the indigenous community whose traditional hunting grounds this is, um, the Western Shoshone, um, they um, conducted a sunrise ceremony, which is a, a very significant ceremony at sunrise, as the name suggests, um, to celebrate our, um, our presence um, on this site and our interest in this site. So this, this sunrise ceremony was, was conducted for our, for our benefit, really. And, and after the ceremony, the, the, the spiritual leader of, the, of, the, of that particular community said how much they, uh, they as a community valued our contribution and the work that we were doing. So again, that, that kind of makes it all worthwhile. You think, okay, this is actually something, we're doing something quite important here. Okay, contemporary archeology span and heritage. Um, those are just there to provide background, but I am going to talk, talk you through a couple of examples now which bring us in more onto the, um, into the area of cultural heritage. And archeology, span if you want to distinguish archeology span from heritage, um, archeology span is a way of doing things. It's a way of thinking about the past and uncovering or recovering and interpreting evidence from the past. Heritage is about what you do with all of that information and what you do with those sites, those buildings, those finds, once they've been discovered. So it's about curation. It's about keeping, deciding whether to keep things or, or throw things away. Which buildings do we want to keep? Which ones are we prepared to let go? Uh, which monuments do we want to preserve for the future? And so forth. So that's kind of the difference. Um, there's a very useful document that's come out, um, well, it's 2005, so it's a little, a little while ago now. It's called the Faro Convention. 
It's a European convention, um, and it's it named after the place where the convention was signed, which is Faro in, in Portugal. But there are one or two really interesting phrases in here that are really useful for us, um, those of us who work in the world of heritage and archaeology as well. Um, and for the first time, the Faro Convention aligns um, heritage work with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it says, for example, that um, the knowledge and use of heritage should form um, part of every citizen's right to participate in cultural life as defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it, it aligns human rights with heritage. Everyone has a right to the heritage of their choice, provided it doesn't impact adversely on other people's rights to heritage. Um, it's convinced of the need to involve everyone in society in the ongoing process of defining and managing cultural heritage. So that's really interesting on two counts. One, that it recognizes the need to involve everyone. So that's, that does mean everyone, whoever they might be, um, and whatever their background might be. Um, and the ongoing process of defining and managing cultural heritage. So that, for the first time, is saying heritage isn't a fixed thing that is always going to be the same. Heritage is always shifting. The way we think about it, the way we define it, um, is always going to be um, um, moving around and maybe getting broader and broader over time. And that's the way it is, actually. What we think about as heritage now is very different to what we thought about as heritage 20 years ago, when I worked for English Heritage. And finally, recognizing the need to put people and human values at the center of a enlarged concept of cultural heritage. So that's what I was saying earlier on about archaeology. Archaeology is all about people. Well, heritage is really all about people as well. How people value things. Who are we preserving these things for? Well, it's people in the future. If we decide we're going to preserve a building so that it's there in 100 years' time, we're doing that so that the people who are around in 100 years' time can appreciate that building. It's about the people, not so much about the building. So here's, a, here's the example I've been promising you um, about heritage and archaeology. So this is about, uh, this is Bristol in England. So it's a sort of moderately sized city in the southwest of, of England. Um, and this is a part of the city called Stokes Croft. Um, which historically, and we know this from historical sources, historically it's where um, petty criminals and people who lived alternative lifestyles used to hang out in the past. It's just outside the old um, gate into the city um, onto the Gloucester Road, so the road that used to run up to the city of Gloucester, which is um, a few miles away. So when people did bad things in Bristol in the back, in the, back in the day, they used to get thrown out of the gate onto what is now Stokes Croft. So it's had a history of, of, of sort of cr criminality and, um, uh, and drunkenness and, and so forth, and alternative living. So here it is today. Um, it's quite famous now because um, this is where Banksy did some of his early work. Um, and this building, actually, is a 1970s office block that's, that was abandoned some time ago. And there was a serious suggestion made to English Heritage to list this 1970s abandoned office block because it's got some early Banksy works in it. And that, that recommendation was rejected. I don't know whether it ever came back and has been reconsidered, but back at the time it was rejected. Um, Banksy clearly wasn't famous enough for uh, a heritage designation. Anyway, this is what the area looks like today. And um, it's a really interesting area um, in terms of um, the work that uh, a colleague of mine uh, did on homeless communities. So it's, it's an area where homeless communities um, feel very safe, to go back to a point I made earlier on. Um, it's where they tend to hang out. They don't all necessarily live here um, or sleep here, but they spend a lot of their time here and they congregate here and they meet in Stokes Croft. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this project in great detail because it's a talk in its own right, but it has now been published as a book with Oxford uh, University Press. You can see that there, authored by um, uh, my um, colleague and former PhD student, Rachel Kiddy, uh, who you see in this picture, with a group of people standing behind her, which comprises some homeless people and some archaeology students from the University of York. And it was a collaborative project 
and the homeless people that we worked with um, gained a lot from being involved in this project. Um, they thought a lot about place. They thought a lot about um, what place means and, and, and how things like places, uh, particular places can matter. And this is for a homeless community. So this is a community who most people think probably wouldn't have those kind of feelings or those kind of close attachments to things, but they do. It's in a slightly different way, perhaps, and they attach, they form attachments to slightly different types of places. So a place where they can sleep um, overnight and not get bothered by other people, a place where they feel secure, perhaps. Um, but nonetheless, they do form these attachments. And there's a very strong archaeological component to this, too. So we started finding these kind of objects around the place. So these aren't, these aren't prehistoric objects or Roman lamps, although they do look a bit like Roman lamps, I suppose. Um, but they're actually the bottoms of um, beer cans that have been torn off um, and turned upside down and used for cooking um, heroin. So it becomes a cooking tray, essentially. So you would tear the base off, um, put, the, put the drug in the, in the um, concave uh, part of the can, um, and then heat it with a cigarette lighter from underneath, which is both dangerous and very unpleasant because the can gets very hot and, and you have to keep holding it, obviously. Um, and then you draw you draw the drug up into a syringe and inject it. So that's how that works. But if you're a, if you're a, if you if you're um, if you're a heroin user and you're not homeless, then you wouldn't be using this. You the the, the medical services in the UK provide you with a sterile um, vessel for doing the same thing. So this is this is an archaeological trace of homeless drug use. Um, and and by walking around the city with homeless people, they interpret these these traces for you and you start to build up a, a really close understanding of, of the city as seen and used by homeless people uh, which is really interesting but the most the most relevant part of this project I think was the sense of purpose and the and the self-confidence that the homeless people who worked with us gained from being involved in that project their sense was wow people actually want to listen to us and and w and all of a sudden we are the experts we're, we're being asked for our advice. We're being asked for to interpret these things for these great, you know, very senior academics. Um, and they, they're asking us the questions. Imagine what that does for someone's self-confidence when they're, when they're really struggling with just getting through the day. And quite a lot of the people, I wouldn't say everybody, but quite a lot of the people who worked on this project who used to really struggle to hold down a relationship or, or just live a normal life in a normal kind of flat or house or hold down a job um, or do anything sensible with money or, or, or give up drugs or whatever it might be or alcohol. A lot of the people we worked with have managed to break those habits and some of them do now have jobs and some of them do live in a normal flat and some of them do have relationships, lasting relationships with, with people and not just a relationship which is about being dependent on them for something. So it had two benefits. We learned from it. We learned a lot about Bristol that we didn't know before, and York, because we did a similar study in York. Um, and, uh, and the homeless people gained a lot from it, too. And this is archaeology. And, and talking to some of the homeless people and saying, so wh why did you feel it was OK to work with us on this? Because they don't trust anybody. They think everyone's out to get them. Um, and they said, well, because you're archaeologists, and archaeologists are OK. <laughs> They're s safe working with archaeologists. Um, and they told us an interesting story about um, being in Bristol and seeing a couple of archaeologists who were working on an excavation in Bristol. They tried to get into this big, new, shiny shopping center to go and buy their sandwiches at lunchtime. And the security guards turned them away, wouldn't let them in because they thought they were homeless people. Um, and they were just archaeologists trying to buy their lunch. And the homeless people heard about this, and they thought this was really funny. And they also realized, wow, we're just like them, or they're just like us. And so they kind of felt safe working with archaeologists. So that's sort of a nice little anecdote. Um, OK, a little, bit, a little bit on landscape. And I'm going to rattle through this bit, because I know we're, we're just we're running a little bit late, I think. Um, but um, I just want to talk about a different looking at this at a slightly different scale, I suppose. So this is Liverpool. So I want to talk about Liverpool now, another British city. Um, and you probably know about Liverpool because of the Beatles, I'm guessing, some of you anyway. 
Um, and it's interesting because when I worked for English Heritage and I started asking about Beatles heritage and whether this was something that was of, of interest, and it was considered to be a very strange thing to be doing, Beatles heritage. Why, would, why, why, why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because millions of people go to Liverpool to, to, to see places like the Cavern Club where the Beatles used to perform. And of course now, two of the Beatles' houses, Paul's and John's houses, are owned by the National Trust um, and, and visited by very large numbers of people every year. So all of a sudden, it's become normal and proper heritage whereas 20 years ago it wasn't. So that's a good example of heritage changing. Um, but what about the wider city? So Liver Liverpool and Beatles heritage is one thing, but it's Be Liverpool isn't only about the Beatles. A lot of other people living in Liverpool, um, and, and it's, um, there are some pretty deprived neighbourhoods in Liverpool. So how is all of this Beatles heritage relevant to most people in, in the city? So this is an old map of part of Liverpool. It's the part of Liverpool where the Liverpool uh, football ground is. So it's the area around Anfield football ground. Um, and you can see here that this is a, a rural landscape. So you can see fields and lanes and some scattered farms and churches and cottages and so on. So that's the um, end of the 19th century. And then what happened at the start of the start of the of the um, 20th century was a very big building program and lots of new houses were built um, and if you see if you look at the transition there you and, and you can see how that how the housing was built over this rural landscape and I don't know whether you can see it but the the, the, the alignment of the housing is 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 on the same alignment as the rural landscape that was there before so it directly followed the grain of the landscape um, and when this project, of which this is a very small part, was presented to people in Liverpool, they were fascinated by this. The people who live in these little terraced houses around Anfield, the fact that their house and their street has, uh, has a history that they knew nothing about, that their, their road used to follow a field boundary that might have been there for hundreds of years before their house was even built. Um, and the fact that this gave them a sort of a slightly more developed sense of history and of time, that there was this depth to the landscape, this very ordinary landscape, nothing special about this place at all. It's just a, a, a normal place, normal part of, a, of another city. But, but in this particular normal place, there's this depth. And th this depth actually exists everywhere, everywhere, everywhere in the world, probably. So it was that, that sense of that mm, light bulb again coming on. So just down the road from there is a, a, an area which is very deprived called Wavertree in Liverpool. Um, and um, I did a project with somebody, with a couple of other people on uh, working with some of the young black musicians in Liverpool um, in this very deprived neighbourhood. And these are, these are um, young hip hop musicians. Um, and this is a guy up here called Pyro. And uh, and we asked him and a number of other people um, from that community to participate in this project and to tell us a little bit about their experiences of the city, which is what they did. And they did it by creating maps. So this is Pyro's map of Liverpool, of his part of Liverpool. And it's his neighbourhood or his hood, if you like. Um, and he's labelled it. And down here it says Pyro's bubble. And he's drawn a little kind of sort of symbol there to indicate Pyro's bubble. And this is his world, essentially. This is Pyro's world. And he puts the city centre down at the bottom, but that's just for orientation. It's not a place he ever goes to, or very rarely goes to. But this is his world, this little area of Wavertree. And he's drawn a map of it, and you can see that his world revolves around people's houses. This is a form of music, after all, which is produced in people's sitting rooms on laptops, and or bedrooms in lap on laptops. And then it's, it's, it's they perform it with each other, they release it online and so forth. So it's not a big performance, a world of big performances or anything, unless you become really famous, I guess. Uh, but, but what he identifies as his significant places, which is, was what he was asked to produce, um, is, um, uh, is basically his house and all his friends' houses, and one or two other places as well, such as the Astro Pitch, where they used to hang out when they were younger, for example. So this is where they their, their friendship developed 
um, HMV record shop, which they used to go to when they were younger. But now they're musicians. Their world is, is all in their, in their cribs, as they call them, or their houses. So similar thing again, working with a deprived, um, in a deprived neighborhood uh, with people who probably have never thought about heritage before, and they probably say, oh, heritage is not for us. That's all about castles and cathedrals and country houses. What we have isn't heritage. And the point of this project is to try to explain to them, well, yes, it is. This is, this is your heritage. The country house and the castle is actually the heritage of a very, very tiny percentage of the population. Um, a lot of people like to go and visit old castles, of course, but, but heritage is more about your place. And this is, this is Pyro's heritage. Heritage is probably the wrong word, and it's not a word that we used when we were talking with Pyro, but we were talking about place. This is your place, and this place has depth to it. It has time depth. It has significance for you, and he showed us what was significant. He showed us the buildings on this drawing of, um, of the places that mattered to him. So it's starting to get that message across, and when you start to get that message across, people feel more involved, and they're more likely to make um, or be in become involved in decision-making as well about that place. So if a developer came along and said, well, we're going to build a whole new, I don't know, big housing development here, I hope now that Pyro and his friends would probably stand up at a planning meeting and say, well, we don't like that. We don't think that's right for this area, and this is why we don't think it's right. Whereas before, they wouldn't have done that. So the Sex Pistols. I had to bring the Sex Pistols in. So you know about the Sex Pistols, I guess. The punk group from England, 1970s, changed the musical landscape. Um, if you come to the Tabacalera tomorrow, you'll hear some Sex Pistols. <laughs> you might have to wait, because it normally comes at the end, but you might get them. Um, so um, when the Sex Pistols first started out, Malcolm McLaren, who was the band's manager, uh, rented a flat for them to live in, in Denmark Street in London. And Denmark Street is, the, is, the, is a street which has long been associated with music and music making. David Bowie, um, Rolling Stones, um, the New Musical Express magazine was based here. So lots of very strong associations. Um, and the Sex Pistols were there for, I don't know, nine months or maybe a year, and then they moved on. Um, and that was that until about... <laughs> eight years ago, probably. And seven or eight years ago, um, I was listening to a radio station, as was a colleague of mine um, on in England, and, and, it, and someone phoned in or emailed into the show and said, did, did, the, did the presenter of this show know that in Denmark Street were all the original artworks that Johnny Rotten, the singer of the band, had, had drawn on the walls of this building? And they were still there, 40 40-odd years, 40 years later. Um, and uh, we heard this, and we thought, hmm, that sounds interesting. So we went there, and we recorded this and published this, and we made the comparison between the, signif the cultural significance of these Johnny Rotten artworks on a building in London and cave paintings on cave walls in, in Spain and France. Um, and the newspapers in England, um, of course, picked up on this story. The way we presented it, it was quite controversial, so they picked up on it. Um, and uh, we, p we appeared on the front page of lots of newspapers in England. Um, and now this story rolls on and on and on, and um, even now in York, this is a, 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 um, a vinyl cafe in, in York, um, and they wanted to um, have a display, an exhibition showing these pictures, um, which is what's happening here. They're being hung on the wall. The picture you can probably see here is Nancy Spungen, who was the girlfriend of uh, Sid Vicious, who was murdered by, by Sid Vicious uh, when the Sex Pistols story started to unravel. Um, and various other people associated with the band as well are featured in these in these artworks. So this is also about significance. It's about how what places matter and why they matter. And we felt that this building in Denmark Street was a really important building in the in the cultural history of of well certainly the UK and possibly even wider than that. So the F word. Don't be too worried. It's not a really bad. It's not a bad F word. Um, I, I, um, how do I put this? 
Um, I suppose I, I started to fall out of love a little bit with archaeology um, when I joined English Heritage. Um, and I never really enjoyed excavation, if I'm honest, which is the thing that you're supposed to really like about archaeology. And, and I felt a bit guilty, a bit bad that I didn't like excavation. Um, but I didn't tell anybody because I thought that might, that might be the end of my career. Um, but I never really liked it that much. And um, I, I, I just the idea of being stuck in the same place for a long time and with my head down a hole in the ground, it just doesn't, it's just not my thing. I'm very, very happy that other people like doing it. And I'm the head of a department at York where a lot of people do that, and that's great, and I love it. But I just don't want to do it myself, thank you very much. Um, so I've, I've often thought about, so, so where, what do I really enjoy? And where, where do I, what excites me? What projects have I really liked being a part of? Um, and in fact, all the ones you've seen here are ones that I've really enjoyed. But I think the one I enjoyed most of all um, was um, the van. I loved doing this project. And it, it, it upset a lot of people. I quite like that too. Um, but it was, more, it was more just challenging people, I suppose, to think about archaeology in a slightly different way. And ironically, given what I've just said about excavation, we did spend 10 days in the back of a transit van, um, uh, mapping all of the things in the van to the minutest detail and producing um, archaeological plans of um, an everyday object, because archaeology is all about everyday things. And here we are, we're surveying the van here. You can see a drawing here, of, uh, which is a, an archaeological drawing of some things. It's a, it's a roll of cables, actually, in the back of the, of the van. So this was really ordinary stuff, very normal things that, that happened to be in the back of this vehicle when it came to the end of its life. And this is what happens to archaeological sites. All of a sudden, for some reason, a place is abandoned. And it becomes an archaeological site that one day, many, many hundreds of years in the future, an archaeologist finds and excavates. And you're excavating the site as it was left, or as it was abandoned, or as it was covered by the sea, or, or whatever it might be. And that's what we did here. The van was being used, it was being used, it was being used. And then it failed its Ministry of Transport safety test. Um, so it couldn't be used anymore. So they just said, oh, we'll get a new van. And at that point, I'd had this idea about doing a project on a vehicle. And they said, would you like our van to do your archaeological project with? So we did. And that was the, uh, that's how this project came about. And we made a film about it. Greg Bailey made the film. He used to be a BBC film producer who happened to be doing his master's course at the university where I was teaching at the time. And uh, so he made this film, which is a really good film, I think. I'm not going to show it to you now, but the link is here, and I guess you'll be able to see that when you look back at this um, um, presentation. You'll be able to find the link. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fun. In fact, if you just Google archaeology in transit, you, you come straight to it. But do listen to it with headphones and in stereo, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of conversation going on in the background. And, you, and, and the, the different conversations are sort of challenging themselves, challenging each other and contradicting each other. And you have to listen to the you have to listen quite closely. But that's, that's the kind of thing I find fun. Not everyone else does, that's fine. Everyone can do their own thing. OK, the relevance of archaeology um, and the relevance of contemporary archaeology in particular and how it, how it really has an impact. I think, I think this is the thing that, that um, gets me up in the morning, motivates me to go to work, um, makes me excited when I'm at work. Uh, the kind of projects I'm involved with. It's not just about me having fun, which is important, because you know, we, need, we need to do that as well. But it's about what, what, but why are we doing it? What's the point of this? Um, the van was all about challenging preconceptions and challenging people to think about archaeology in a different way. And it did that, for sure. Um, but there are other reasons why we do it as well. So this is a very personal part of the story, if you like. Um, so this is the Teufelsberg. I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but it's a big, well, you can see it's big. It's a, it's a huge Cold War um, uh, listening station in Berlin, in the Grunewald in Berlin, the big forested area. Um, and it was built by the Allies in the Cold War to listen in on the conversations that were happening on the other side of the border um, in the Soviet Union. So it was to listen in on um, 
uh, East German pilots and the conversations that East German pilots were having with each other and with ground control. It was designed also to listen in on, um, if they could get access to it, to government uh, ministers and conversations uh, within, within government as well. So it was a, it was a listening post. And this is what it looked like on the 7th of July, 1971, the significance of which I'll come back to in a minute. And that's what it looks like, well, it, what it looked like in 2009 when a colleague, of, a colleague and I conducted a very detailed survey of this, of this vast and very dangerous site. It's abandoned now, but it's, but it's got sheer drops. It's got a lot of it, as you can see, as you can probably see from the image, there are no windows. Um, so it's everything inside the buildings, it's completely black, pitch black. Um, so on a, it's on several floors as well. So just getting around the building safely with sort of head torches and you're having to look up all the time to see if there's anything hanging down that you could bang your head on. You're having to look at the floor to see if there's a huge hole that you're about to fall down. So it's just really dangerous. And we were trying to map this building at the same time. So just a couple of pictures just to show you um, what it looks like in its abandoned state. So the graffiti artists have been in, for example. We had floor plans of the building, so we were trying to use archaeological methods to work out what the various rooms within this building were used for, because there's no, uh, there's no archive at all for this. It's all, well, there is, but it's all classified and will remain classified for a very long time. So it's a very secure site. And down here, the only archive that exists is the East German secret police, the Stasi, who did manage to get one of their operatives into the building. Um, so he was a spy, basically, and he managed to retrieve some information, including some photographs. Um, and if you look at this photograph closely, you'll see that they've all got the little black um, band over the eyes. So it's a classic Cold War um, photograph. So I'll come back to that in just a second. But one of the other things about the Teufelsberg um, is that it's now used as a big techno party venue. So it's a place where you can just go with your sound system and you just make it known that you're going to have a party there on a Friday night running through to the Sunday. Um, and everyone just goes there and, and there's nothing to stop it at all. And this is like all over Berlin, these things are happening and on in abandoned buildings or just pieces of ground. Um, and these pop-up parties have become a really big deal. The big techno clubs in Berlin, like the Trezor and the Bergheim, um, local people do go to those clubs, but they also get a lot of tourists. It's these pop-up parties that um, tend to be where the young Berliners tend to go for their, for their weekend. And I love this quote, a city is there to be interpreted, does not divulge the meanings of its symbols to everyone. You have to know how to decipher them. For the uninitiated, Berlin's club scene remains virtually invisible, a secret hidden world right in the center of the capital city. So that's, that's kind of where the archeologist comes in, I think. Because this is often the way with archaeology. There's, there's, it's very hard to read the signs in a, in a prehistoric landscape, for example. It takes a lot of skill to do that. And I kind of find myself looking at these record sleeves and this, this, from a, this is from another, uh, you know, it's a bubble blower from another uh, party venue in Berlin. And you start, to, you start to put all these parts of the jigsaw together and understand the behaviors that underlie these artifacts. I'll come back to Teufelsberg in just a second in my closing slide, but I um, just want to go back to Galapagos, just, just coming, coming to the end now. Um, but um, Galapagos is just fascinating because it, it kind of brings me right back to my early days in archaeology because it's, um, it's, it's trying, to, trying to tell stories through artifacts. And when I was first starting out, it was stone tools, very old stone tools, and you'd hold it in your hand as a student and you'd think, so what can I learn about the people that made this stone tool? And we'd be taught by our tutors uh, to look at the different, you know, every single uh, little um, scar on this stone tool was the, was the evidence of a, of, of a particular blow that took off that flake. So you can see how the tool was actually created and where was it found? Well, that will tell us about the way it was used perhaps as well. And what it was found with, was it found with some animal bones, for example? Well, that may indicate that it was used to break up those animal bones or, or cut the meat off it in some way. So you start to build up this story. And that's kind of what we've been doing on Galapagos as well, uh, but with plastic objects that have been washing up on the beaches. Um, and we've been trying to tell stories of individual objects that are washing up on the beaches, because we think that the way the problem is being presented 
like there's billions and billions of tons of plastic in the sea and on every beach you go to in the world there's just piles of plastic it's kind of well, what do we do about it then it's just too big a problem for anybody to even get the start to get their head around and our thought is well if you go back take it right back to basics and go back to the individual items and start trying to tell stories about the individual items and you might be able to get to the point where you can say well this object probably ended up in the sea because someone did something which led to it getting there and it's a human action and we think that if we can get to that point of being able to say it is human is humans that are causing this problem i mean everyone knows that but bringing it down to the individual items and saying with this bottle for example someone probably left this somewhere the wind blew blew into the sea that was avoidable you didn't have to do that you could have put it in a bin and it would have ended up in the recycling plant it's really basic stuff but if you start to tell stories about the the individual objects um, that we're finding on the beach, then um, we think that we can make a bit of a difference. And that, for me, is an archaeological approach. And there's a lot of clues in these items, all the little codes and so on, and the type of plastic it is, and the, the shape of the bottle. Sometimes, you know, you look at a bottle and you think, well, that's not what water bottles generally look like these days. And you look online and you find out, well, that bottle hasn't been made in that shape for 10 years. So it's an old bottle. Clearly, it's an old bottle that's washing up on the beach, which means it's either been floating around the sea for a very long time or it's been on the beach for a very long time. And then you can start to look at the bottle itself and you might think, OK, it's got such bad bleaching, it probably has been on the beach for 10 years because of the sun, the impact that the sun has. So it's all about um, reading the, the signs within these objects. And this is the impact. You know, it's just terrible. This is a, this is a beach that I was at a few weeks ago on Galapagos. And this is Galapagos, you know, it's, it's um, a, 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 a World Heritage Site, place where Darwin went and, and the theory of evolution and so forth. And then, you know, you've got things like seabirds full of with their stomachs full of bottle tops. So we have to do something about it. And, thi and these images are being shared on social media all the time. And it's good that they are because that's making it more and more obvious as a problem, an environmental problem. Um, but um, we think there is another way of looking at this as well. And that's where archaeology comes in. So just to finish, back to the thing about, about people, um, a lot of this, um, for a lot of archaeologists that I know, comes down to the first, the first person. It's about, it's about us as individuals. And we can all tell stories about our own lives um, which have some sort of an archaeological or material dimension to them, an object that has a particular attachment, for example. So here we are at the Teufelsberg again, and here's my dad. And my, my father was the, um, the main reason I was drawn to this site is that my father was the officer commanding the um, Teufelsberg uh, from, and it does actually say in this document, um, one of the few documents that has been released by the National Archives in England, because there's nothing incriminating within it, um, but it does have the date, and it is the 7th of July, 1971, which was the date, if you remember, that, that of, the, of that photograph of the, of the site. So that's when he was brought in and he was posted there for two years to run, that, to run the British operation at the Teufelsberg um, on, that, on that date, just after a major building phase had been completed. So they'd obviously done a lot of work to the site, brought him in, he did his two years, moved on, and someone else came in and took over. And here he is in a photograph that he always said was taken at the Teufelsberg, but other people have said there were never any photographs taken at the Teufelsberg. It probably would have been taken back at the, the station where he had another office. Um, but that's, that's what he told me. But it is almost the only thing he ever told me about the Teufelsberg. Because everyone who worked there signed the Official Secrets Act. And if you sign the Official Secrets Act, you're not allowed to talk about this stuff. Um, and it's not an act that you can unsign. So once you've signed it, that's it for life. And my father was one of those people who would honor that and never spoke about the Teufelsberg, other than the fact that he worked there. But he never spoke about the work he did there. So for me, this was about trying to find out a bit about my dad. I wanted to know what he did. And um, he wasn't going to tell me. He di <laughs> died nearly 20 years ago now um, and took all of his secrets with him. So I thought, OK, what do I do? I do archaeology. So I'm going to go to this building. And, uh, and uh, we had other reasons for going as well. But my reason, my particular reason was I want to know a little bit more about him. Um, I didn't find out much more um, about him 
Um, but I found out a lot about what the site, how important the site was and what was going on there. So back to the homeless project. This is my penultimate slide, I think. Um, and this is, this is Rachel again, the person that did this work. And this guy in the middle here is Punk Paul, who was a homeless man, um, was a homeless man. Um, and uh, uh, he died um, last year. Um, but here he is being interviewed um, about his involvement in the project. And I've got some words from him in a minute that you'll, you'll see, um, which give you a sense of how much he got from this being involved in this project. And you'll see on the, uh, on the table here, just the top of a stone vase, which was something that he always carried with him in his bag, which you can see this camel colored um, bag on the screen, on the uh, just lying on the table here. Um, and this was a kind of a sort of, he found it very hard to articulate what this object meant, but it was a kind of some sort of representation of a normal domestic life that he didn't have. Um, and he used to carry this thing around with him. Um, and it was almost as though he never said this, um, and he may not even have thought it, but it's almost as though maybe he had something like that at home when he was a child and it kind of reminded him of it or something. It's something like that, um, but we don't exactly know what. And again, as with my father, uh, Punk Paul is no longer there to ask about this. He died last, um, uh, in, in oh where did you see, October 2017. Um, homelessness is a very invisible world, a very invisible life. People appear, they disappear. No one really knows where people go. Um, when you go to a homeless funeral, um, well, if you go to a homeless, a homeless funeral, you're probably going to be the only person there. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very, very isolated and very Im, um, impersonal life in the sense that nobody really knows you because you keep all those, keep all your information to yourself. You don't trust anyone. Um, but, um, but Paul was very much liked and Paul is not invisible because a plaque was put up for him in Stokes Croft. And this was the plaque, which someone nicked a few days later. <laughs> But um, but it came back, so it's uh, it's back. Uh, but this is th this um, and had a little quote from one of his friends as well that he never took more than he needed. And just to finish, these are Punk Paul's words, and this was how he expressed. I'm not going to read them for you. I hope you can read them yourself. Maybe the translator could just translate this actually. Um, but this is um, this is how he described his involvement in this uh, in this project, and I think for me it it conveys better than I can, why this kind of work is important. And when the translator gets to the end of that quote, I will say thank you very much for listening. Uh, thanks for a really, really interesting talk. Um, I was one of the things I picked up on that I was particularly interested in is the intersection of kind of political struggles with your work, and especially some of the peace camps. Um, and that made me think, think of um, the ZAD in France. I don't know if you know it, the Z Zone à Défense, um, which is a quite um, a long-lasting occupation. Um, in a, in a wilderness area that was set for development as an airport. Um, and that was recently bulldozed by the Macron government, um, almost all of the site, including sort of some very, very complicated structures, some very kind of advanced, advanced communities. Um, and what that was sort of making me think about is, is whether there's a, um, a political struggle over 
sanitization that is at the heart of, of what can be called heritage and whether, in a sense, things can only be labelled as heritage after they've been sufficiently sanitised. Um, mm. And that kind of... I was also thinking in the situation of the Sex Pistols um, with the manager recently burning an enormous number of artefacts because he didn't want them to be kind of commodified mm. um, and sanitised. It sort of valued at sort of a few million pounds. So I was wondering what your perspective is on whether sanitization is, is avoidable or even if it's desirable in archaeological work? Great question, thank you. Yeah, really good. And um, I don't know about the, the, the French examples, but I will, I will I'll look that up. That sounds fascinating. Um, when we wrote the paper about the Sex Pistols and we published it, um, we also struggled with, with that same issue that you described, the, the question of sanitization. And you're right, it comes up in a number of the other examples as well. But the one where we particularly felt it was the Sex Pistols work. Um, because this was punk, you know, and heritage and punk don't go together, or they shouldn't. Um, so we coined the phrase anti-heritage. So it's kind of, so is there a different, is there a kind of um, an anti-heritage approach? And we got, we got criticized for that too, because the anti-heritage approach to it, I suppose, would be, well, just let whatever happens happen. Mm -hmm. And if someone decides they want to destroy it, then that's up to them. So that's the point you make about the, you know, the burning of the stuff. That's punk, after all. Um, but then you think, yeah, but those, those things are really important. <laughs> like the, yeah. you know, the artifacts that were burnt by, um, it, was the, it was the manager's son, actually, mm -hmm. his, his son that did it. But yeah, same, same thing. And you think, yeah, but those things were really valuable. They were, they were you know, some of those were just one-off. Um, so I don't know what the answer is to that question, except to say, yeah, absolutely. It, it's a really tricky dilemma because the, the once you start to recognize some of these things as heritage, you're, particularly with the examples I've been showing, you're kind of, you're kind of getting into really dangerous ground, I think. Um, English Heritage have now listed, well, it was all, the building was already listed at that where the Sex Pistols artworks are. It was a listed building anyway. But the, the grading of the listing has been increased. So there's a higher level of protection on that building now. Um, and they, list, uh, they listed, they increased the grading of the listing in the 40th anniversary of uh, the Sex Pistols. Um, and, um, and it was a factor. In the in the upgrading, so so it does have now kind of official status because of the Sex Pistols. So I don't feel very comfortable with that. I think it's a bit weird, mm. to be honest. So I think that I don't know whether that answers your question, but it yeah. gives you a different perspective on it, maybe. Si no hay más preguntas, lo damos por terminado. Recordamos que mañana a las siete y media, siete y media, seis y media. Bueno, en algún momento hacia las seis y media o siete tendremos una rey party en Tabacalera con John Scofield. Os esperamos allá todos. Muchas gracias.